welcome to the uh, GSE slash uh, Sesame Colloquium. And uh, we're very lucky today to have with, with us uh, Grace Neville uh, from the University of College Cork, also the National University of Ireland. And uh, some of you have uh, probably already seen uh, uh, that lady abstract and a bit about uh, Grace. So uh, let me just say that uh, um, it's a very uh, daunting to uh, be in her presence. <laughs> and uh, as you probably uh, know, she uh, spans both the French and Irish languages. And turns out Irish is a, a language on itself. It's not just English with a brogue or anything. <laughs> There's that too. Gotta yeah. Gotta believe it. <laughs> it's hard for me to learn, but I just do that eventually. And uh, she has, uh, in addition to her undergraduate degrees in those languages, she has a uh, master's in French from the University de Caen, I pronounce that close enough, and a doctorate in comparative uh, literature, um, French and Irish again, from the University of Lille. And uh, she's uh, not only Professor Emerita of French at the University of, uh, of Col College of Cork, uh, but she was vice president for four or five years, uh, vice president of teaching and learning, so that's pretty darn related to education as well. Um, and uh, she was also the director of the National Academy for the Integration of Research. Uh, and uh, her publications the, on the academic side and her research is more on Franco-Irish relations, medieval to modern, as well as women's writing and uh, uh, language history. And she's uh, been honored by being invited to many international juries uh, of the uh, National Research uh, Agency in France. Uh, she makes recommendation to the uh, to the uh, prime minister, including the past prime minister, if I recall. And uh, these are on pedagogical innovation at their national research agency. And she's the chair of strategic orientation of the strategic orientation committee at the Sorbonne. And uh, it, it all it all sort of. Uh, uh, susses out with me because I actually had lunch with her near the Sorbonne, so <laughs> that part of the story checks out. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, she's been an uh, evaluator of uh, institutions for the French National Review Agencies, and uh, she has two very impressive uh, French state awards, including the Legion of Honor, mm -hmm. which is amazing, and uh, the Palme d'Académies. And uh, not only that, uh, she's uh, dabbled on this side of the Atlantic and has uh, consulted at Harvard of, uh, for a number of years. And uh, the, uh, so, and in fact, uh, the president of an Irish University said that no matter where he goes in Europe, it seems that everybody knows her. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm honored That's to... That's a recommendation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In the good way, I think. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're honored to have her, and her title is A French Revolution for the Third Millennium. Question mark. Uh, the reimagining of higher education in contemporary France. And at least she'd, uh, she'd like to get out the uh, initial salvo, and then she's happy to take questions and conversation. And so, without further ado, I give you Grace Neville. Thank you. Is it okay if I sit here, or would you prefer if I go to the podium? Whatever you prefer. Yeah. Is fine. Yeah. You can hear me from here? Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. I'll sit here. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank you, for starters, Professor Rani Michael, my, my friend, for inviting me here, for agreeing to have me here, and also for, to the colleagues in your department, to Professor uh, Goldwasser, and to everybody else for having me here. It's an immense privilege for me to be in Berkeley today. Um, it's my, not my first time in San Francisco and not my first time in Berkeley, but it's my first time here officially. So it's an immense privilege and delighted to be here. Um, and thank you very much for coming. So I hope that what I have to say um, is of interest to you. Um, and as Michael said, I'll take questions afterwards. So I've divided my paper into two main sections. Um, at the start, I'll outline the ongoing reforms in the French higher education system over the last 10 years or so. And then I'll explain my own involvement in these um, in, in the discussions around these reforms as a member of various committees in Paris. But then I'll come to the main part of my paper, which is kind of going away from facts and figures and so on. And it's much more of a personal reflection on these reforms, on what they're about, and on what they tell us about contemporary France. 
So the story starts on the 6th of July 2009. On the 6th of July 2009, the then President of France, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, wrote a letter to his Prime Minister, François Fillon. He wrote him une lettre de mission, so a, a letter with a mission in it. And he said in the letter that France had to prepare for the future and that it had to identify key priorities for the coming years and draw up an action program um, for government over the, the, the coming years. And specifically what he said in his letter, um, he said that he wanted France to engage in un grand débat sur les priorités qui doivent préparer l'avenir de notre pays. So a major debate on the priorities for our country and our country's future. And he said that les responsables économiques, les acteurs du monde de la culture, de la recherche, de la formation. So he said that the people um, in charge of the economy, culture, research and so on in France, he said that their voices had to be heard. So this was a clarion call. And he also said something very interesting. He said, il faut aussi regarder au-delà de nos frontières. He said, we've got to look outside France for inspiration as to what we in France should be doing over the next number of years. He said specifically that we had to look at the réussite de nos voisins et concurrents. So the successes of our neighbors stroke um, um, competitors, and that we had to look at France, at les atouts et les faiblesses de la France, at the, the, the strong points and weak points of France, à la lumière de leur expérience, in the light of the experience of these people outside France. So following that, a working group was set up. And interestingly, and I hope that you don't know all of this intimately, if you do, it's okay, you can put up your hands and say, skip to the next bit. <laughs> you know, I say this to my kids, I say, or to my students, I say, when you got, get bored, put up your hand and I'll do something. But a working group was then set up. And very interestingly, for me as an outsider, um, the working group was, was uh, chaired by a centre-right and a centre-left politician. So Sarkozy did not kind of uh, put his friends and supporters necessarily running this working group. It was a centre-right and a centre-left politician. Two elder statesmen, hugely respected. Uh, Michel Rocard, uh, centre-left, and Alain Juppé, centre-right. So basically he gave them the job of drawing up this action programme. And they assembled a group of about 20 people, um, 10 men, 10 women, um, and they were, f they were told to bring forward an action program within four months. So again, the urgency of this. Um, so they were to bring forward an action program by the 1st of November, four months later, so that the following year, in 2010, the priorities on the action program could be implemented. So the working group came up with a list of seven priorities, or seven axes, as they call them. That, so seven main um, areas that had to be looked at in terms of driving France forward. And I'll start at the end. I'll start with the bill. Um, the uh, funding for this was to be 35 billion euro. So in terms of dollars, would that be 40-ish? 50 billion? Or, yeah, mm. a bit more, something like that, billion dollars. So what were the, the, the priorities that were identified? Well, among the seven priorities that were identified, small and medium businesses, life sciences, the environment, tomorrow city, and so on. But by far the number one and the, the highest financed priority was to be axe number one, soutenir l'enseignement supérieur la recherche et l'innovation, so to support higher education, research and innovation. And of the 36 billion euro that were set aside for the action program, 16 billion was to go to this. The total budget of 35 billion euro, and um, apparently, and I'm not um, a good financial person, but apparently with leverage and so on, that was able to raise 60 billion um, of funding. What fascinates me, uh, and there are two things that I want to start with, I suppose I find all of this fascinating, but one of the things that I find really fascinating is that the priority in this action programme by far was to be given to higher education, um, research and innovation in terms of its place in the list of priorities and in terms of the amount of money given to that. The second thing that surprised me was the fact that it was um, Sarkozy, Nicolas Sarkozy, who um, launched this investment programme. Um, I think that it's fair to say that when people think of uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, they don't necessarily how will I say this delicately? <laughs> they don't necessarily think of him as 
um, uh, an intellectual, um, a person who is passionate about higher education, um, somebody for whom this is by far the priority he has and had other priorities. I don't think that this would be normally associated with him. If you contrast him, for example, to the current president, Emmanuel Macron, Emmanuel Macron has always said that he sees himself as a philosopher, as a former colleague and research assistant of Paul Picard, someone who somehow wandered into politics, but who in his heart and in his soul is a philosopher, an intellectual and so on. I think it's fair to say that nobody would see Sarkozy like this, yet it was Sarkozy who launched this program. The other thing about Sarkozy is, of course, he's a centre-right wing politician. And again, and I know that I have French friends here, I think it's fair to say that the education system in France, generally speaking, would see itself as maybe centre-left, not centre-right, but it was Sarkozy who launched this. You might say why, and I've asked people in the ministry why it was Sarkozy rather than somebody else, who basically, I wouldn't quite go so far as to say staked his reputation on this, but he was the mover and shaker behind all of this. And people say that the Shanghai rankings that came out in 2003 had a huge impact on this. Now I know, I don't know about Berkeley, but where I live we say, oh rankings aren't important, and then everybody's very worried about rankings, so we're kind of split on all of this. So when the Shanghai rankings came out in 2003, and when France basically wasn't anywhere to be seen in the Shanghai rankings, despite the fact that it has world-beating institutions in many areas, this was a kind of a wake-up call to um, senior politicians and people like Sarkozy. There was an element of French pride, of national pride, that was hurt by the fact that this was, this was a, an international kind of image going back to France. This was not how France saw itself. So there was the very strong feeling that something had to be done around all of that. And of course then, in 2008 and so on, there was the financial crisis. And again, a very strong feeling that France needed an action program in order to pull itself out of the financial crisis and that the way forward would be higher education, research and innovation. A third element in all of that, and again going back to um, uh, Sarkozy's Lettre de Mission, when he said we have to look beyond our, our frontiers. In other words, there's a phrase in French, you know, Franco Francais, you look into your heart as a French person. Um, we had a president in Ireland once, uh, Eamon de Valera, who was actually born in New York, and he said once that when he wanted to know what Irish people thought, he simply looked into his heart. He didn't need anybody out there. Well, Sarkozy said there was going to be no looking of by French people into the French heart. We had to look beyond our territory, beyond our frontiers to see the way forward. And where they looked to, they looked to Germany. In 2005, the German government launched a program, again, um, around research in higher education, aimed at improving that whole area and seeing higher education and research as a driver. So the French quite unapologetically, I wouldn't quite say copied the German programme, the German initiative d'excellence, but the French programme is very, very closely modelled on what the Germans were doing. Up to, relative, up to quite recently, for example, the um, programme that the Germans um, put in place in terms of higher education and research um, had a budget or spent a budget so far of something like 5 billion euro. And following competitive calls for proposals in Germany, the initiative resulted in the identification of nine German universities as world-class universities, the establishment stroke strengthening of about 40 doctoral schools throughout Germany, and the establishment of 37 clusters of excellence um, covering research between third-level institutions and industry. So the French decided that they would do something similar. And in particular, and um, the, the, the French initiate, well, initiative d'excellence, which is what it's called, again, very similar to what the Germans called their initiate, initiative. The French initiative d'excellence, looking at higher education, um, aimed at, I was going to say, solving, addressing, looking at certain um, issues, some people might say problems, um, that are long-standing and go way, way back in the history of higher education in France. One of them was the very strong belief that the French higher education landscape was far too fragmented, with world-class excellence being divided among different institutions, very often single faculty institutions, single discipline institutions like engineering and so on. So the aim was to do what the Germans were doing, which was to fuse or result or bring together institutions in order to create something like nine 
or 10 world beating institutions out of a fragmented um, landscape. You can go back, and again, I don't have time and I'm summarizing you know, very, very crudely, but you can go back and look at the history of higher education in France from the time that Robert de Sorbonne established the Sorbonne in the 13th century. And you can look at one hand the university, and on the other hand, you can see these parallel institutions that were very often set up because whoever was running France, whether it was the king or much later on the president, had problems with universities and decided um, in order, in, rather than tackling the university system or maybe failing to tackle the university system, so um, setting up parallel institutions. So for example, in the 16th century, the very powerful king of France, uh, François Premier, um, in his quarrels with the university, decided that his solution was going to be to set up a separate institution. Hence, he set up the Collège de France, which is there literally opposite the Sorbonne on the Rue des Écoles in Paris. So it was a bit like a two-fingered salute to the Sorbonne. You know, I can't reform the Sorbonne, I can't control the Sorbonne, so what I'll do is I'll set up my own you know, fabulous parallel institution, which is still an extraordinary um, highly prestigious institution uh, there in Paris. You can skip forward several centuries um, to the 20th century. In 1945, Charles de Gaulle and Michel Debray set up ENA, the École Nationale d'Administration, which is the, um, the, the, the preparatory school, in a sense, for France's senior civil servants, diplomats, ambassadors, uh, future presidents, and so on, the current president is um, a graduate as uh, have been you know, many, many previous presidents. Um, so, so again, these, these standalone institutions, um, the feeling behind the current reforms is that really it's much too fragmented and we should try to get people uh, to marry each other, bring them together, you know, fuse institutions. Another um, issue that, uh, again, uh, goes back quite far, at least to the start of the 19th century in the French higher education system, is the division between the universities and the grands écoles. So we've got the universities on one hand and the extremely prestigious, very elite, and some people would say elitist, grands écoles on the other hand. So the feeling very much was that this was not a helpful division and that people should speak to each other, they should work with each other, they should collaborate with each other and that really together we'd be stronger. Um, the in interesting thing uh, around that, again to get back to Sarkozy and the, you know, the slight, I wouldn't say mystery, but the, the interesting uh, fact that you know it was Sarkozy who was behind all of this, pushing it forward. Sarkozy didn't go to a grand école. He's one of the very few presidents in recent history in France who never went to a grand école. He went to a university. Um, so he didn't go to one of these elite institutions. He went to uh, Paris University, and sometimes, certainly, the universities are not as well financed as the Grands Écoles. And I don't know if I'm summarising. You know, they certainly wouldn't be seen as being as prestigious. So the idea was really, you know, the time to work together has come, and, and this is what we're going to do forward, uh, going forward. So there was a very strong top-down government impetus in all of this. This was not a bottom-up movement. This came absolutely from the top, through senior statesmen uh, and so on. And then on top of that, there was the prospect for higher level, higher um, education institutions who always need money. There was the prospect of getting their hands on some huge funding. So this was meant to be an incentive. You've got the government saying this is the way to go. And you've got German experience across the border who seem to be doing fine. And this is the way they're going. And then you're invited to apply for huge funding for uh, a chunk of 16 billion euro. The way the um, initiative was, was implemented, it was implemented on a, a call for funding, so a competitive call for funding was sent out to the higher education um, institutions. And the ground rules were fairly obvious. You've got to collaborate, you've got to come together, particularly in geographical areas, whether you're talking, particularly, say, in the provinces, you know, so different kinds of institutions, uh, universities, grands écoles, uh, the IUT, Institut Universitaire de Technologie, uh, the smaller, for example, maybe art schools. So the idea was that the heads of these institutions would come together and would try to convince the jury in Paris, in the INR, the 
um, Agence Nationale de la Recherche, the ministry, and so on, they would try to put coherent fusion marriage proposals to this jury. The jury would make recommendations on whether this would fly. The recommendations would go to the prime minister and, and, and so on. So that was the um, that was the sequence. In the first round of funding, uh, the budget was 7.7 .7 billion. Uh, the second round of funding was 3.1 billion. And we've been told that there will be a third round of funding um, with huge emphasis this time on the, the whole question of university pedagogy, uh, sorry, higher education pedagogy and lifelong learning. So my ringside seat in all of that, um, in 2011, just before I retired from my university, um, out of the blue, I got an email from the Ministry for Education in Paris telling me about these um, initiatives and asking me if I'd like to be a member of the jury um, that makes recommendations to the Prime Minister, who makes recommendations to Parliament, um, on the way forward and on the funding and so on. And in that context as well, um, 200 million euro was set aside um, in order to encourage people working in higher education in France to think about pedagogy and maybe reform the way they were teaching, just the whole area of teaching and learning. Um, I was asked to chair the two committees that were in charge of that. People in the ministry apologised for the fact that only 200 million were reserved for that and I assured them that 200 million in an Irish context <laughs> was, was an awful lot of money. And they said that compared to the billions that were going for um, research and innovation and so on, this was quite a small budget. So as I said, I told them that it wasn't small at all. But they also said that it was Sarkozy who said that when he was when his spokespeople came to him and said, you know, this is the way forward, put 16 billion into higher education, research and innovation. Uh, they said, Sarkozy said, yeah, well, okay, if that's what you think, but what about teaching? What about the quality of teaching? Uh, so some money was set aside for that. So over the last number of years, over the last eight years or so of rounds of funding, you might say, what has that led to? But starting at the end, um, the uh, aim of creating, of bringing institutions together in order to create a small number of heavy hitting institutions. And I would say as an outsider that that is well on its way and that in many cases this, this has been achieved. And just starting outside Paris, for example, the universities in Strasbourg have come together and the end result is that like, now there is a university in Strasbourg, you know, l'Université de Strasbourg, which is very highly regarded. Similarly, Grenoble has pulled its higher education institutions together. Likewise, Bordeaux has pulled most of its universities together, not the humanities one, but the others. Ex-Marseille and so on has come together. In Paris itself, um, as Michael said, I'm the chair of the Strategic Innovation, the Strategic Orientation Committee um, in, so in the Sorbonne, Sorbonne Université. So Sorbonne Université is now the result of, I wouldn't quite say a merger, because people said it's not a merger. Um, the universities of Paris 4 and Paris 6, which more recently um, were, de were called um, Université de Paris Sorbonne and Université Pierre et Marie Curie, they've come together. Um, to create a new university and they have very, very strong links with the business school, with INSEAD, which is a private business school, and with the Musée Homme, which you may have visited in the Jardin des Plantes in Paris, which is the French uh, equivalent of the Smithsonian. Um, it has a different status, so you can't just you know, merge these people and run them together. Um, and there are a number, a number of other higher education institutions that are in that new um, university that exists now since the 1st of January last year. In Paris, again, other kinds of higher education um, units have come forward as the result of marriages between uh, different institutions. One of the most interesting ones, and again, uh, you, you may have heard of it, PSL, Paris Science et Lettres, is a very interesting new creature in the landscape. Um, it's somewhere between a traditional university and a grande école with very, very um, kind of uh, grande école type entry requirements for the students. As you probably know, French universities, generally speaking, don't have entrance requirements. That's a huge debate at the moment, whereas the grandes écoles do. Um, and PSL, Paris Sciences et Lettres, is uh, strongly affiliated with the Collège de France that I mentioned earlier on. And um, when we were int interviewing uh, the former president of PSL um, some time ago for funding, 
um, on this committee that I mentioned, and he mentioned that he has over 20 Nobel Prize winners working um, in his institution. I know that in Berkeley you have lots of them, but 20 um, Nobel Prize winners is a lot of Nobel Prize winners. So I asked him, I said, yeah, but like, are they just trophy names? Do they actually teach? And he said, yeah, they teach, they work, you know, they're in there. They have contact with students. So there are new kinds of creatures on the landscape that um, I find fascinating. So that's one um, result. So new marriages, fusions, whatever you want to call them, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And um, rankings, I mentioned that um, maybe like many countries, in France people say rankings don't matter, but then if you rise in the rankings, suddenly they do. Or indeed, if you sink in the rankings, they really do. Um, yeah, there have been movement, you know, there has been movement in the rankings. Um, other uh, changes, I hear people all the time now saying that they can collaborate with people in institutions where up to now they wouldn't have been collaborating, they wouldn't have seen these other institutions or research groups as, you know, that the opposition, whereas now, uh, again, because of these new um, alliances, marriages, fusions, um, that's not the case. Um, certainly an area that I'm very interested in, the whole question of teaching and learning, the quality of teaching, the quality of learning, um, that has changed. Um, when I got involved in all of this around 2012, um, in the two uh, initiatives that I mentioned, that I chaired, um, so calls for funding, uh, competitive funding around new ways of teaching, new ways of helping students to become better learners. Um, I didn't think that you could change a culture as fast as the whole area of teaching and learning has changed in France. Um, in 2011, 2012, I heard, I had people say to me, you know, I'm very interested in teaching, I'm very interested in my students learning, but I really can't spend any time on it because that's not how I get, um, um, that's not how I get. Um, promoted. Um, one person in the Sorbonne one day said to me, he said, all of that is fine, but he said it would be suicidaire for me, which I thought was like an, an extraordinary description. He said it would be suicidaire for me to spend any time on teaching, learning, that kind of thing. I'll get promoted because of my um, research and that's where I'm at. Um, in, since 2012, that has changed. So, um, uh, innovations like teaching and learning centres, most French universities now have teaching and learning centres in 2011, 2012, they simply didn't. And um, I was at the university, I was invited to the University of Moulouse on the French-German border there last year. And it's very interesting, their new teaching and learning centre is right in the middle of campus. It's an award-winning, um, architecturally amazing building. It's like a spaceship landed, that landed on the middle in the middle of the campus. So symbolically, um, the, the, the kind of the move in from the edges of teaching and learning, um, I find quite interesting. Um, national awards, teaching awards have been set up. Um, you can now, in some institutions, get a sabbatical for going off and thinking about teaching. And um, all of these would have been absolutely unheard of just a few years ago. And um, someone said to me recently, she said, la pédagogie n'est plus un gros mot. So pedagogy is no longer a rude word. You know, you can kind of come out and say, I'm interested in teaching and learning. One thing, and again, this is just, I suppose, a list of things that have changed over the last number of years, as I've seen them from my ringside seat. And the whole, and this is something that I'm particularly interested in. I would say that because of these reforms, and um, the whole student experience in higher education in France, particularly in the universities, has improved. For example, in the Sorbonne, where I'm quite au fait with, with the changes that have taken place. Um, the students now, in what used to be Paris 4 and Paris 6, they now have access to all facilities across Paris, libraries, sports facilities, uh, subsidized housing and so on, whereas before it was much more a kind of a silo, um, a siloed landscape. There are far more interdisciplinary programs and so on, and some really quite um, innovative ones. Um, some time ago in the Sorbonne, I was asked to judge uh, new proposals that had come in around new, new, new ways of teaching. Um, and one person or one group of colleagues put forward a proposal for teaching ancient Greek through dance. Now, I know nothing about ancient Greek, and I pretty well know nothing about dance. But they said that stress and accent and so on um, seemed to work. So these students, these kids, were learning ancient Greek through dance. And um, I had the pleasure of seeing them in action um, at the end of their program. In all of this, I'm kind of, I started at the end to say, has 
any of this, has this changed anything? And I would say that it has changed things, you know, in a very radical way, or is changing things in a very radical way. Obviously, in all of that, there have been surprises, and um, some surprises, some disappointments. Um, at the beginning, people said, well, of course, it's the Paris institutions that will grab all of the money, and then the um, universities and the provinces will yet again be the poor relations. It will be the Sorbonne and the various Sorbonne colleges who will just go home with all of the goodies. And that's not what's happened. Um, in the first round of funding, the first round of recommendations to the Prime Minister, because I should have explained that the committee that I'm on, we make recommendations to the Prime Minister, not the Minister for Education. We kind of bypass all of that. We make recommendations to the Prime Minister. Um, and up to now, the various Prime Ministers have accepted all of the recommendations that have been made. So at the beginning, people felt, oh, yeah, well, this is another trick. You know, and Paris is going to run away with everything. That's not what happened. It was very interesting, particularly early on, to see some of the smaller um, universities from the provinces who were lean and mean and who were able to change far faster than a lot of the Paris institutions were able to do. So just to take a few examples, the University of Nice, for example, was one of the big successes in terms of um, being accepted for you know, its new configuration um, early on in, in the um, initiative that I've been describing, to such an extent that the minister, sorry, that the president of the University of Nice, who came to present her new proposals to us with her colleagues, she was so good and so convincing that she's now um, minister for higher education in France. She was taken in by the government. You know, she was so good at that. She was so convincing that they said, no, 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 we're good. we need you. So she's now minister for um, higher education. And another university that, again, I suppose, in terms of prestige and so on, would not until now have been highly regarded would be um, the University of Sergi Pontoise, just outside Paris, in a new town and not a particularly desirable part. Well, all of Paris is very desirable, sorry, but you know, it, it's not exactly, you know, the Montagne, saint Geneviève. it's not, you know, bang in the middle of the Quartier Latin. Well, they came forward with a young president and a young team and they absolutely blew us away in terms of their ideas for the future. And again, one person on their team, well, they were all very convincing, and one, one person was so convincing that again, the ministry said, you know, come, come, come work with us. So that was one thing, the fact that the provinces came forward, not all of the Paris universities, at least at the beginning, and they didn't get over the line. Obviously, there's a fair amount of opposition. There has been, and there is a fair amount of, of opposition to all of this. And this comes from honest criticism, and you can understand that. The whole question of equality and rankings within the French higher education system is now quite overt. Until relatively recently, there was this idea that all institutions are equal, or maybe not the grands écoles, but certainly the universities. Now, people in the know knew that that wasn't the case, but now you have the, the heavy hitters kind of moving forward within France in the, the, the higher education landscape, and then the others, you know, somewhere in the middle and somewhere at the back of the field. And France is in France, if you think about 1789, the French Revolution, equality is in French people's DNA. It's written on all French buildings. You know, you go to school in France, and every day you go to school, you go under a motto that says, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité. So it's in their genes. It's in it's 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 the founding rock of of the French Republic. And here we're saying that actually, yeah, equality is fine, but you know, not all institutions are equal. Um, so an awful lot of people, understandably, have issues um, around all of that. It brings, kind of linked to that, it brings the, the reality of competition into higher education in France. So institutions are competing with each other for funding, for prestige, and for the, the, the label of EDEX, you know, that you succeeded in the EDEX, the Initiative d'Excellence, um, initiative. So th there is competition where until recently, at least at an overt level, um, there wasn't that level of competition for funding and indeed for, for status. It's brought in the um, reality of individualization as well. And um, generally speaking, most French university professors are civil servants, are fonctionnaires, and they have un statut de fonctionnaire. And um, this is certainly not the case in Ireland. So they have 
traditionally, and I'm looking at my friend René here, and you can <laughs> correct me, um, René is a professor in the French education system, a very well-known professor of Irish studies, so you can correct me if this is wrong, but the idea of, of a salary scale and you know everybody moving forward at the same pace, that now under these initiatives is going, going, gone. One of the things that we ask the university presidents, the grands écoles presidents who come to our um, who are interviewed by our committee when they look for funding and when they look for recognition under the initiative d'excellence, we say, what are the packages that you are offering the best scholars, the best researchers all over the world? And can you give us instances of where you have recruited the best people from North America, from Asia, and, and so on and so on? And how did you get them in? And what were the, the, the packages? So the idea of a fixed salary scale and everybody moving forward at the same pace, that under these initiatives, um, that is gone. And I've mentioned money. Um, the whole question of fees is now on the table. Uh, traditionally, French universities are more or less free. It's something like 200 euro a year. Mm -hmm. For an Irish person, this means free. Um, the student accommodation is subsidized, student canteens are subsidized. Mm -hmm. And you can get a degree from, for example, the Sorbonne, you can get a doctorate from the Sorbonne, and it will cost you a few hundred euro um, at most. The whole question of money and so on, uh, as I said, it's come up a lot in what I've spoken and what I've said um, so far. There's a debate going on in France at the moment. It's like all bets are off because of these initiatives. The unspoken is now being spoken. And people are saying, well, free fees, okay, but can we sustain that? So there's a proposal at the moment, which is being floated, that non-EU students should pay maybe a bit more than 200 euro a year. And philosophically, understandably, that is creating huge difficulties because a lot of people in the French system, and I completely understand, they say France is a land of welcome, it's une terre d'accueil. And traditional, well, historically, going back centuries, as an Irish person, I mean, in the Middle Ages, it's where Irish people went, and um, when Catholics in Ireland couldn't um, study, higher, you know, couldn't go to higher education. There was Trinity College for Protestants and there was basically nothing for anybody else. So where did they go? They went to Paris, they went to France, they went to the Irish colleges that were set up there. Mm -hmm. So there is a very, very strong tradition going away back in France of, you know, we accept people. I know there's a debate on migration and so on at the moment. But still, I think like equality, it's in the French DNA that this is an open country and as far as possible, we try to welcome people. We don't stop them at the gate. We don't say, yes, but where's your visa card? And if you look at a lot of the leading intellectuals in France, for example, people like Julia Christeva, and, you know, born outside France and now hugely important, and, and they would see themselves as French intellectuals. Oh, sorry, they can see themselves, they are seen as French intellectuals from outside France who are welcomed into the country. Again, people like Samuel Beckett and so on, the list is endless. And um, I was at a, a conference last month in Brittany in the Université de Bretagne Sud in Vannes and um, on autonomy in French universities. And the former minister for higher education in France, Valérie Pécresse, was there. Uh, a woman who is very, was very influential in changing universities while she was in charge of them. She's now president of the Ile-de-France region, so she's basically president of Paris and that whole region. Um, she said she was in China recently. She's a very interesting woman. Um, she said she was in China recently, trying to get people to come to France, study in France, study in Paris, and so on. And she came across some people who said, well, you know, all of that was fine, but they were actually going to go to the States. I can't remember which institution, but they wanted to study in the States with um, a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, French economist called Jean Tirole. And so they were going to sign up to a, an American university to do that. And Valérie Pécresse said, but Jean Tirole is from Toulouse, and he teaches in the University of Toulouse, and if you went to Toulouse, you could study there in first year with Jean Tirole, and it would cost you 200 euro per year. And the Chinese people she was speaking with said, no, that can't be the Jean Tirole, that we're going to pay 60,000 or whatever number of dollars. <laughs> that must be his... It's double <laughs> you know, it's it actually, you know, like in um, Goodwill Hunting, do you remember the, 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 the 
scene in Good Will Hunting where Matt Damon, Damon mm -hmm. sends his pal, Ben Affleck, mm -hmm. into a, a job interview and people are wondering, who is this idiot we were told he was a genius? So, you know, who is this Jean Tirole back in Toulouse who's basically teaching all of these people for nothing? They said, no, 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 we prefer to go to North America and study with the Jean Tirole in North America. <laughs> <laughs> so Valérie Pécresse was there saying, honestly, you know, you people, the... Um, Coloc, the, the, the conference in, in Van was for was organized by the CPU, the Conférence des Présidents d'Université, so it was all the presidents of the universities in France and the directors of the Grands École. And Valérie Pécresse, in her own stylish way, said, honestly, you know, you people should get your act together, you know, you're losing out on something. So as I said, the unmentionable is being mentioned. Another unmentionable that's being mentioned because of these initiatives is the whole question of teaching through English. Now, the French language is actually enshrined in the French constitution, la langue de la République et le français. Um, so, until relatively recently, I would say all teaching in higher education in France was in French, and then in business schools, little by little, because they're looking for international students, kind of under the radar, they started teaching through English. Um, North, Northern Europe, obviously, you know, you go up through Holland into Scandinavia and so on, they teach through English. But now, increasingly, over the radar, if that's a phrase, people are teaching through English. And these initiatives are very overtly encouraging stroke, demanding that people teach through English. Because they say you won't have an international audience and you won't attract the best postgrads and you won't attract the best professors from all over the world if you insist on everything being done through French. So, um, a small thing, but when I was invited to be on the various committees that I mentioned in Paris, one of the things that surprised me originally was that all of our discussions, everything is done through English. Um, I spent most of my life trying to learn French, I'm still trying to learn French, and there I go to Paris and everything is in English. So there you go. One of the disappointments for me, and I have a list of, I suppose, surprises, stroke disappointments, one of the disappointments for me in these initiatives and what we saw coming forward is the, um, the, the, the kind of absence of humanities or the, dis the, the, the lack of interest in by people in humanities in what's happening. It's being uh, propelled by people in science, in medicine, in business and so on. And there is a very, very strong call for people in humanities to get involved in these initiatives. But the, the, the response has been less than, 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 than present, so to speak. And I suppose it kind of ties up with the whole debate, the whole reality, the whole challenge certainly in the worlds that I know anything about at the moment, about humanities and what's the future for humanities and, and so on, you know, Martha Nussbaum and so on. Resistance as well, and this is the end of my little list here. So disappointment, stroke challenges, stroke resistance. And I mentioned the very strong uh, hope, stroke encouragement, that the traditional division between the universities and the Grands Écoles would at least begin to um, soften that people would speak to each other across the barriers and so on. And it's interesting and really quite unsurprising to see the resistance of some of the Grands Écoles, but not all of them. And um, in that context, the resistance of Polytechnique, which many people would see as, well, certainly one of the most prestigious, some people would say the most prestigious of the Grands Écoles, has been quite um, remarkable. And the idea was that, or well, the hope originally, was that Polytechnique and the University of Paris Sud, Saclay, which was given one billion euros by François Hollande to create something new and interesting in that part of Paris, the hope was that these people would start speaking to each other and um, Polytechnique, generally speaking, the graduates of Polytechnique rather than the people actually in Polytechnique were the people who led the resistance, um, led by Jacques Attali in particular, who's um, a graduate of Polytechnique and actually of four grands écoles altogether. So the idea was that, you know, we were set up at the beginning of the 19th century by Napoleon um, as an engineering school because Napoleon needed stunningly good engineers in order to set up his empire, in order to run his empire. And we've been walking down the Champs-Élysées every 14th of July, Bastille Day, in our military uniforms with our swords and so on, and we are not going to... <laughs> we're not giving that up in order to, you know, become... 
some kind of part of a, a, a university. So the resistance of some Conseil Cole has been, uh, as I said, strong but not unexpected. Having said that, there are discussions you know, going on between Polytechnique and the wider landscape, um, maybe much to the chagrin of Jacques Attali, but anyhow, Polytechnique is still there and it's still a separate institution and it looks like that's going to be the way forward. To make some of this more real, um, I thought I'd give you two instances, um, kind of more at a, a micro level, of, of what all of this um, means. And taking an example from the Sorbonne, which as I said, I, I, I know quite well, um, the two major universities that merged, married, whatever you want to call it, um, Paris 4 and Paris 6, um, Basically, it meant that in this new configuration, there would be one president, you know, one HR department, one of everything going forward. Um, presidents in universities in France are elected, they're not um, headhunted. Uh, so the president of what had been Paris 6 is now the president of Sorbonne Université. So it meant that the person who was president of Paris 4 didn't go forward for election uh, to be president in this new configuration, which I think is very courageous um, and shows a great sense of uh, public service, and I'll come back to that um, in a minute. The, the difference for students, and again, this is, I suppose, the area that I'm most interested in, it means that the students of what used to be the University of Paris 4 and Paris 6, there are 50 plus thousand of them, um, it means that they can now um, do major minor uh, programs in a way in which they couldn't before. They can major in medicine, minor in philosophy. Um, Paris 4 would have been regarded, I think, as the leading humanities university in France. Paris 6 is a hugely important medical stroke science university in France. So the possibilities for students of major, minor, interdisciplinary programs are fabulous now compared to what used to be the case. Um, there's a huge problem in France, again, that senior, well, that everybody, but particularly senior politicians have been very um, concerned about over many years, which is the dropout rate of students in first year, the décrochage in first year, um, with students kind of wandering into university and then not being very happy, not being in um, degree programs maybe that suit them. Um, since there, generally speaking, aren't entry requirements or high entry requirements in universities, it means that huge numbers of students fail at the end of first year. So de facto, the entrance requirements are the exam at the end of first year. And if you take the most extreme example of that, until very recently, that students could go in, take first year medicine, and then the failure rate at the end of first year medicine could be something like 90 something percent. Mm -hmm. and what's happening now, uh, various ministers have said, you know, why are we doing this to our young people? You know, you wouldn't do that to an 18 year old. You wouldn't put an 18 year old, really, if it was your child, into a situation where 90, there, were, there was a 90 percent chance of them failing. Um, so the, the idea that you would uh, maybe have a more flexible first year where people might start out in something, move to something else. Um, again, this is having a positive impact on the huge problem of student uh, dropout in first year because of the new configurations. I mentioned new possibilities of interdisciplinary programs as well. And again, just very briefly, I'd like to take an example of a, an interdisciplinary program that I saw up close and personal because I was one of the evaluators. Unfortunately, it didn't get through. It didn't get funding, but that's, that's another story. It came from the University of Paris-Est, so Crete and Marne-la-Vallée. Um, Crete is a very traditional university in a very disadvantaged part of the east of Paris. Marne la Vallée is a new post-1968 university organized on very, um, it's got a very kind of flat structure, um, it's not organized in, in terms of departments, it's more thematic. So these two universities were going to come together, they were bringing in Ponts et Chaussées, which is one of the most prestigious engineering schools in France, founded in 1780, 1747. And they also brought in the leading veterinary college in France, Maison Alfort. So it was a very interesting configuration. And they put forward a proposal um, around a theme that they wanted to explore in an interdisciplinary way. It was going to be L'homme et la ville. I know that sounds very sexist in an English context. So man and the city. So tomorrow's city. And they were 
where they proposed that they would have philosophers, architects, medics, all kinds of people working on this, and that the laboratory was going to be the disadvantaged part of the east of Paris where the university was situated. And um, unfortunately, as I said, it didn't get through for funding, but I thought it was particularly interesting. You might say what happened to the institution, so that didn't get through, the heavy hitters who didn't get through, the lean and mean provincial universities that did get through. So what happened to all the others? There are about 80 universities in France. So is this a recipe for, you know, the rich get richer and then the poor get poorer? But very interestingly, some of the smaller institutions, some of the universities in the provinces, who realized that they would never be the Sorbonne and they would never be Harvard, but they're, you know, they, they're ambitious and they want to make an impact. So they decided, quite a number of them decided to reinvent themselves. And I just take two instances that I find very interesting. I mentioned the University of Moulouse in the east of France, so it's on the French-German-Swiss border. And they decided that what they had going for them that the Sorbonne doesn't have going for it is they know all about borders and they know all about frontiers. And you think about that part of France, and you think about the history of that part of France over the last hundred years, and the way almost for a while, every generation, you know, the border was reconfigured. So they decided that they would do something very interesting and they would run degree programs that would be co, um, the, the, yeah, degree programs that would be uh, given, signed off on by the University of Moulouse and by the University of Freiburg in Germany. So the students going there would get an international degree and part of the degree in France would be taught in German, part of the degree in Germany would be taught in French, and they would work in an interdisciplinary way on everything to do with frontiers. So that's literature, it's geography, it's hard sciences, it's humanities, and so on. Um, and it's very interesting. Now, you think about French students in a French university studying, not languages, but studying chemistry through German. I find that very you know, interesting and courageous. A second example that I would take would be the University of La Rochelle on the west coast, on the Atlantic coast. La Rochelle is a very interesting city. It was an ecologically aware city, uh, an ecologically active city decades before um, other people got in on the act. So La Rochelle decided again that what it has going for it, that the Sorbonne doesn't have going for it, is it's on the coast. So they decided that they would specialize in coastal studies. So everything from geography to engineering to literature to art and so on in an interdisciplinary way. They would try to weave all of that around and say, if you want to study the coast, you know, hard sciences, humanities, La Rochelle is the place to go to. So just briefly, so all of that is kind of facts, figures, committees, and so on. But I suppose my, the more personal part of my presentation is what do I think about all of this as an outsider with a ringside seat? And René is actually in the middle of all of this, so you're living this. I'm not. I, I go to wonderful committee meetings in Paris and people are incredibly generous and they treat us so well and they take us out for wonderful meals and then you get on a plane and you go home and it's the people back at base who have to live with all of this. Um, as an outsider, when I talk to my friends in Ireland about this and they say 16 billion euro, don't you mean 16 million? I say no, no, 16 billion. <laughs> they say, what is that funding about? <laughs> and very often we don't get beyond that, and sometimes I kind of think, you know, this, this is extraordinary. But in the French context, when I'm on these committees, when I'm dealing with senior civil servants, politicians, and so on, it's not the money aspect of this that strikes me most. The thing, I suppose, the take-home message, or the thing that has struck me most about all of this work that I've been doing since 2012 and so on, is the vision and the persistence and the clarity of the people who are running this in France. So it's different presidents, prime ministers, senior civil servants, government ministers and so on. They are so on message. And despite the opposition and despite misgivings and so on, they say this is the way forward. It is education that 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 you know is the solution to whatever woes France is having at the moment. And, and I find that fascinating. So it's, it's, it's not the money. And education is the priority above all. They keep saying education is the key to a better future. And in a French context, I find this really interesting because I tease my friends in Paris and I say, this is very Third Republic. 
the Third Republic in France went from 1870 to 1940, and it is usually, or it is very often described in a French context as um, la République des instituteurs, mm -hmm. so the Republic mm -hmm. of the primary teachers. Mm -hmm. It was the couple of generations when primary teaching changed France, when the primary schools changed France. In the 1880s, Jules Ferry, mm -hmm. the Minister for Education, brought in compulsory primary schooling for all French citizens, boys and girls. And you might say, well, that's grand, but like, how do you implement it? He said no French child should be further than walking distance from a school. So, he set up a whole network of primary schools, and then he said they have to be taught by the best teachers. So teachers were trained, and then they were inspected because, you know, before quality control was ever thought of, he said we need quality control for our, our young people. Um, and to quote the title of my favourite book that was ever written about France, and I'm, you know, long in the, 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 the job now, but by a mile, um, Peasants into Frenchmen, The Modernisation of Rural France, 1870 to 1914, by the historian Eugen Weber, who was born in Romania and was educated in France and taught in Stanford. So the transformation of France between 1870 to 1914 via the primary schools. Um, and this, in a sense, I feel as an outsider, as an interested outsider with my ringside seat, I think this is what explains all of this. Um, education um, is the way forward. So no fees, uh, student-centred, um, and, and, and so on. I've lost track of the number of times that I've heard the various people that I mentioned, politicians, civil servants, and so on, talk about something that you can't translate into English, which is l'ascenseur social. It doesn't work in English. They talk about education as, a, as an ascenseur, and it's what will change people's lives. And in English, if you say a social lift, or social <laughs> escalator, or social elevator, you see, it, it, it doesn't work. Now, when I talk about this with my French friends, they say, oh, that's rhetoric. And that's not true. And, you know, they're very, um, not as rosy as me about it. But I'm, I'm not so sure, because uh, to take a tiny example, um, a couple of summers ago, I was invited to uh, a kind of a thinking um, in Paris by the Conférence des Présidents d'Université. They have a thinking every summer um, in Paris for a few days. And the event was to be opened. The event is opened every year, traditionally, by the Minister for Education. But the previous day, um, there was a new Minister for Education. A new minister was, was uh, in office, Najat Vallaud, Belkacem. And people said, oh yeah, well, she won't come along because it's her first day in office and she's very busy and it's been a surprise appointment and so on. And she turned up and she said, when I saw in my diary that this was the first event that I had to attend in my new role as Minister for Education, she said, pour rien au monde, for nothing in the world would I have missed this. And it was very symbolic for me because everybody, Najat Vallo Belkacem was born in 1977 in rural Morocco. And um, according to, well, everybody knows, she's described it before. She was born in a village with no electricity and no running water. She moved to France with her family. Her father worked on a building site. And she came up through the French schools, no fees. She ended up in Sciences Po in Paris, <coughs> very prestigious, <coughs> Grande Ecole. Um, and when she was welcomed to this event by one of the university presidents, he said the following, it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen. He said, pour tous ceux d'entre nous, dont les parents n'ont jamais fait d'études, for all of us here, so he's talking in a group of 80 university presidents and directors of Grands Écoles, and then me as the little foreigner. Um, so for all of us here whose parents never went to university, he said this is a big day that you should have come here. And the symbolism of it was incredibly powerful and for me very, very moving. In other words, if we're here, it's because of the French Republic and because of the emphasis that was put from the time of the Third Republic up to now um, on trying to improve um, people's lives. I'll take one other tiny example. Some time ago I was invited to an engineering school in Saint-Ouen, north of Paris. It's a very, very deprived area. And there were two young uh, engineering professors there. Um, and they said that their aim in their work was to get the kids in the surrounding area to come and study, and particularly to get the girls in the surrounding area to come and study engineering. So they had fabulous programs going um, with local schools and so on in order to encourage kids to come in um, so that 
you know, this ascenseur social and so on would be um, in, in, in evidence. Just very briefly, I suppose, I, like I was saying, the first thing that strikes me is that in France it doesn't seem to be about the money, it seems to be about the ascenseur social aspect of all of this. The second thing that strikes me in all of this is the presence of the ministry. In Ireland we have a minister for higher education, but I hope he's not listening. He kind of doesn't pay us an awful lot of attention in a good way. And I mean in universities, we get on with what we do. And universities in Ireland are state institutions. Um, but we are hugely autonomous and we don't bother the minister and generally speaking he doesn't bother us you know it's a very good relationship and <laughs> in France the minister and the ministry seems to be for me very present in people's lives mm -hmm. maybe in a good way maybe sometimes not so much so the minister the senior civil servants come to our they, they welcome us to meetings they um, come for example I suggested my committee suggested that national teaching awards should be set up. They were set up. The minister awards them. The minister awards them in the ministry on the Rue des Cartes in the middle of the Quartier Latin. It's very, very symbolic. So the ministry is there in person and in spirit. And then there are other um, examples of the ministry in people's lives in the way in which simply doesn't exist in Ireland. Um, I think the average academic in France has to be in a classroom for 192 hours in the year or it's in a contract or something. I caused a mini riot sometimes, some time ago in Paris in the ministry when I said that in 35 years of teaching in Ireland at a university nobody had ever counted up the number of hours that I spent in a classroom. It would be a bit like asking somebody how many hours did that article take you to write? Mm -hmm. It's not really possible to put a number of hours on something like that. You work full time. In Ireland you work full time, you discuss with your colleagues who teaches what. If somebody is finishing a book you say okay, you know, we kind of work around uh, all of that. But this business of 192 hours, I'm still trying to get my, my head around it. I suppose the third thing that I notice in all of this, so the vision, the presence of the ministry, but certainly under these new initiative, the wish and encouragement, again very in a very top-down way, that people would experiment, that they would try to do things differently, and that if they fail, actually that's okay too. You know, you can, you, you can backtrack. Rather than saying, well, let's never in innovate and let's never experiment, because that way we won't fail. And the ministry, the president, uh, in a very top-down way, um, are trying to shake that up. And, and that, in its own way, um, is quite difficult. And I'll just point to another few things, I suppose, in all of this that surprised me. I mentioned these committees that I'm on. Um, the committees consist of non-French people. And the main committee that I'm on that makes recommendations and so on, the, the one I mentioned, um, 16 people and I think there are two French people on it, but they're not from the university system. Um, so we come from North America, there's someone from Caltech, we come from all over Europe, but we're not French. Um, so we make recommendations to the Prime Minister and then we go home. So I asked in the Ministry one day, I said, do you mind my asking a question that I find intriguing? Why are these committees not for the French people? In Ireland, if you had committees like that, and if you had a budget like that, the first thing you would do is you would put your, dare I say, friends, but you know, you'd pack the committee. Well, maybe not, but you probably would. And this is the exact opposite. Um, and the ministry, in the ministry I was told, well, it's because you're not French that you're of use to us. Because when you make recommendations, and when they're difficult recommendations, we can always say, well, this, these recommendations were made by outsiders. And up to now, they have all been accepted. We made some very difficult recommendations over the years. Uh, we made recommendations, for example, that were discussed in Parliament because people were very unhappy with them, and understandably, um, when, for example, we agreed to support and finance um, institutions and not others that left certain parts of France, huge parts of France, without funding and without this, this label. So those... Um, recommendations went to Parliament and were discussed and some people were very unhappy with them but they were carried in the end because people said look at the end of the day they were made by dispassionate people from the outside so I find that very interesting and I find it incredibly courageous and um, that that you would do that 
Um, th there are other things that I could mention, just very, very briefly, and I kind of touched on this, and I suppose it's one of my last points. I mentioned um, the idea of the common good earlier on. Um, in how will I put this delicately? People don't discuss their salaries. In Ireland, people don't discuss salaries much. You know, it's regarded as very impolite um, and so on. In France, university salaries tend to be quite modest by Irish and English standards. And many of the people who are heading up the institutions that I mentioned are on quite modest salaries by, institute, by international standards. Um, many of them have given up posts in North America, for example. I know someone who gave up a post in the Harvard Medical School in order to go back to France to head up in a, a university in a very tough area. Um, and there are lots of examples like that. Um, I think I mentioned this to Michael earlier on. Um, it's a better example. A few summers, a, a few years ago, maybe about three, four years ago, the president of PSL, the new university in the centre of Paris that has links to the... Um, to the Collège de France, there was a huge controversy uh, across the media when his governing body decided that his, his salary should be increased to the crazy amount of 150,000 euro a year, which is maybe 170, yeah, like 180,000 dollars. Mm -hmm. And people felt that this was madness. <laughs> I mean, the idea that somebody running a university in the center of Paris with 20 Nobel Prize winners on his staff the notion that he could aspire or hope to earn as much as 150,000 euro, people felt this was madness. And that if he wanted to earn such a fabulous salary, well, he should go and work in a bank or something. Mm -hmm. But that this was really not how we did it in the public sector. And um, so in that context, a lot of people have given up much more um, lucrative posts elsewhere to come and work in the public sector because they believe in the public sector, they believe in public education. Um, one example that I have, again, of somebody that I work with in Paris um, who gave up a job in the private sector in order to come and run a university, he said he was very happy to do so because he said that his grandparents were manual workers and that France gave him a fabulous chance in life and that now was the time to come back and, and give something back. So just in conclusion, there are two, I suppose, two thoughts that I would leave you with. One is that these changes aren't widely known outside France. And on the committees that I'm on, we make recommendations all the time to our French colleagues. We say, really, you know, you should be going to conferences, you should be going to teaching and learning conferences, you should be going to conferences, you know, wherever, and telling people about this, you should be, as researchers, researching the work that is being done as a result of the decisions that are made by the Prime Minister, following on from these committees and so on, and French people and France in general seems not to be doing that. Um, and it's not quite clear why. Maybe in the teaching and learning area, which is one that interests me most, there is still, I think, the idea that in order to pronounce yourself on teaching and learning, in order to give a paper at a, a scholarship of teaching and learning conference, that you have to come from a department of education. Um, that somehow education belongs to departments of education, even though there are quite a number of really interesting people in France at the moment working in the whole area of education reform who are not themselves originally from departments of education, people like Michel Lusso or François Tadei and so on. Um, so the story of what's happening um, is not well known outside France, and I suppose the other way around, I find increasingly that in the English-speaking world, certainly in Ireland, we tend not to look at countries other than English-speaking countries now in order to see what we should do about issues like student loans or student or education reform. We look at North America, we look at Australia and so on, and we tend not to look at what's happening in continental Europe, which I feel um, is, is a, a matter of great regret. So I suppose in all of that, um, as an interested outsider with my ringside seat, I salute the, courageous, the courage and the audaciousness of what's happening in France at the moment. And I suppose I would leave you with the anecdote, which is probably based on nothing, but in 1972, you all know the story about the Chinese um, um, Prime Minister, the Chinese um, Prime Minister who was asked, Xuan Lai, who was asked what he thought about the impact 
of the French Revolution, and in 1972 he said it was too early to say. Well, all I can say <laughs> is that I hope that in many, many years to come we can all meet again and that we can see what the impact of this particular French Revolution has been. So thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>
the, the, the university, the one that I mentioned, one of, sorry, one of the possible experiments that I mentioned, which was Paris Est, which was a very traditional university in Crete, running with the university, a much more um, innovative university in Marne la Vallée. Um, the reason they didn't get through is that most of the humanities people in Crete said, we want to stay the way we are, we're not so interested in interdisciplinary stuff, we don't really want to work with engineers, we're happy as we are. The end result is that, yeah, fine, but they don't get the resources. I don't know if that's, that's an answer. I don't it's, know either. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a very difficult situation for a it lot is. of these people who should be exactly some of the people getting resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, 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 sorry, it's, sorry. it's very top down as well. You mentioned Rennes and Rennes 2. Again, I have loads of friends working in humanities in Rennes 2. And that's an, a university that, again, up to now has decided not to play this game. Uh, whereas the other universities like Rennes 1, and that's changing, but they're, they're the ones getting the resources. And the and office, the science campus, yeah, and the <laughs> office, yeah. But yeah. but in a, in a way, dare I say, like the I don't know if it's the answer, but an answer to that would be, well, have you thought of different ways of being a humanities department, a humanities university okay. in the twenty first century, yeah. and or do you want to continue in the kind of more siloed um, structure that existed? going back. I mean, I know a lot of people, and it's not a criticism, in my own university and so on, the courses that they teach, which are very good courses in humanities, they are the courses that were taught 20 years ago. If you sat in on them, you'd wonder, are they any different from the courses that were taught 40 years ago? Or is there a new way of being a humanities professor in the world now? I could go on about how I modern know. my colleagues are and how interdisciplinary they are and they're okay. not getting funds, but uh, sorry. <laughs> there must be other questions. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, I cut you off. Yeah. You, you can't really talk about higher education in France without talking about the role that higher education plays in the self-identity of the nation-state. Mm -hmm. As you said, uh, Les Grandes Écoles date from Napoleon yes. and, the, and the whole necessity of recruiting civil servants but also civil servants, not only in the industry world and the business world, but, uh, or in the military, like the Polytechnique, but also recruiting future academics. So, École Normale, École Normale d'Ulm, École Normale de Sèvres are providing the, the next generation of academics. That's why you have the two diplomas, the doctorat, le doctorat d'État, mm. doctorat dans les universités françaises, et l'agrégation. Mm -hmm. And many people who have a doctorate from a university still can't teach without the aggregation because the aggregation ensures you have a job ranking, uh, as we know, through concours, etc., in uh, the French not only higher education uh, system but in the secondary schools. So, and, and you've got the, the hierarchy between aggregation, CAPES, and, and, and all these diplomas. So that's why you have the minister uh, so present, unlike in, 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 uh, in Ireland, yeah. but in France, because the ministry is responsible for the education of the upcoming generation of, of France, of French, if you wish, citizens, that is going to form the l'armature, the, 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 the scaffolding of, of the French identity. So when you talk about a revolution in higher education, you're also talking about a revolution in the self, uh, the self understanding of the French nation state. And so my question to you is, how has be, how have all these uh, new initiatives been accompanied by a new understanding of the French state, uh, of its role uh, as as a state, as a, as a nation? Um, for instance, uh, I mean, I'm particularly sensitive to the, the CNU, the, the Comité, the, the, the Conseil National des Universités, that ranks the disciplines. So if you get a doctorate, you still cannot go on the open market and, uh, and, and apply for a job. You have, to, you have to apply for a job within the category that has been 
decided for you by the Conseil National des Universités that are you dans les sciences du langage, are you dans l'éducation, are you in linguistics, and, and, and whether you are categorized among the linguists is going to make a whole lot of difference to your salary and your prestige than if you are dans les sciences de l'éducation or les sciences du langage. And meanwhile, we're saying that they have to be cooperating with each other and be, be cross-disciplinary. Yes. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. To get money. Okay. On, on the main committee that I'm on, so there are 16 people. One of them is the former vice-chancellor of the University of London. Um, there's somebody from the um, IPFL um, and so on and so on. Um, so non-French people um, with far more experience of actually running um, universities and so on than I have. And they say, first of all, if they were running France, or if they had more power than they have, they would get rid of the CNU. And secondly, a lot of them say they would get rid of the aggregation. And I heard the president of Paris, oh wait, I know, I know. The president of Paris 4, wait, wait, wait. So, more recently called Paris Sorbonne, um, uh, Barthélemy Jobert, who's a huge, so he's head of the main humanities university in France. He's an art historian, he's an extraordinary person. And the first, and you know, I've heard him say that he would like to recruit people into Paris 4, people who don't have the aggregation. He said he doesn't see what it adds. It's very Franco, Francais, other countries don't have it, and he doesn't see what it adds. So, so, so what, what is he replacing the aggregation with? Like in other, in other countries, you know, you get a job in Oxford, you get a job in Cambridge. There is no equivalent in other countries that I know of, of the aggregation. You do a good, you do a good doctorate, and you, you do a good thesis, you have a good mentor, you, you apply, and so on. So they, 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 they keep saying, please, that recommendations to the minister, um, we keep saying, please get rid of the saying, you think about getting rid of the agreg. And you mentioned, obviously, the Ecole Normale, so you can these extraordinary places with amazing students and fabulous uh, and, um, professors, some of them I know through my work, um, in Paris, it's not the idea of getting rid of the Ecole Normale Sup, whatever about getting rid of ENA, that's slightly different. But places like the Ecole Normale Sup, I think these um, initiative, initiative, the idea is that there would be more, um, more collaboration between them. And I suppose the good example of where the experiment at the moment is at is the um, um, PSL, Paris Sciences et Lettres, where they have, uh, I think they have the Ecole Normale Sup, um, the Collège de France, a uh, very, very strict kind of grand école type entry requirements for their students, um, and a small, lean, very well financed institution. Of all of them, I mean, I know I'm chair of the, um, the, the Comité d'Orientation Stratégique in the Sorbonne, but that's more traditional. The one I would like, if I could flash forward 10 years, I'd love to know what, what, what happened or what is happening, what will happen with TSL, because I think that that's the way forward. Well, uh, we're uh, getting uh, close to time. I thought maybe I'd just ask one uh, it's sort of vaguely follow-up a logistic question, but my sense was that in Europe often uh, many of the undergraduates at least don't go to class. In fact, the classes aren't large enough to accommodate all the people should they want to. And it's more of a sense of, oh, well, we'll, we'll study, we'll do the readings, and then we'll take the exam. Is that true in, in uh, many of the, the French universities, or is that more like a German kind of thing? That they it, don't go to class. Like, would they have capacity if everyone went to class? Because it sort of relates to the teaching and learning and teaching pedagogy learning, part. Yeah. How can you do that if they're not around? I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I don't know how I'd break into that. I suppose one thing I would say is that until very recently, the whole question of excellence in teaching, excellence in learning was not on the agenda. But if you say, this is now important, and what's, what follows on from that? Well, I've said this, this is kind of um, one of my hobby horses. I keep saying, if I had to make one intervention, I would make an intervention in first year in large lecture theatres in first year. I would put my stars in there. And I would also question whether this is the best way of teaching 17, 18, 19 year olds who may not really be in the right course. I would put my resources in there. And the question then of whether they turn up. You know, if you put your stars in, and if not all stars are interested in teaching, and not all stars are good teachers, but there are stars out there 
who have it everywhere. And I know, like I have friends in different countries who are star researchers and prize winning teachers. And I would just say, you know, inter mm -hmm. break, you know, d do something about the first years. And put your energy but in the first And the graduates are in college, they're not at university. Oh, okay. A oh, university okay. In, in Europe is a university, it's not a college. I see. So the four years of college, mm -hmm. uh, two, of, two of those years are subsumed under secondary education, and two basically, that's why we have the junior, the junior year abroad. After two years, then the uh, American students are at the same level as entry university students mm -hmm. in Europe. That's at least mm -hmm. how they... Uh -huh. In principle. The, the pecking order would go. Well, please, I, I believe Rachel will be around for a bit if people want to come up and, and uh, converse further. But thanks so much for coming, and thanks so much to Grace. Thank you so much.